for tonight's Conversations with Great Minds. I'm joined by one of the country's foremost experts on nuclear security and nuclear nonproliferation. As the president of the global security organization, the Plowshares Fund, Joe Cirincione is on the front line of the fight to prevent the spread of dangerous nuclear weapons. He's also a member of Secretary of State John Kerry's International Security Advisory Board and on the Council on Foreign Relations. Before taking his position at the Plowshares Fund in 2008, Joe worked on non-proliferation issues for the U.S. House of Representatives, the Center for American Progress, and the Carnegie Center for International Peace. He's the author of a number of books on nuclear weapons policy, including his latest, Nuclear Nightmares, Securing the World Before It's Too Late, a fascinating and often sobering look at the reality of modern-day nuclear destruction. Joe Serencioni joins us now in the studio. Joe, great to have you with us. Thank you, Tom. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for joining us. Let, I'd like to start out with you. What, yeah. what got you interested in the whole issue of nuclear proliferation, nuclear weapons, non-proliferation, uh -huh. this whole issue? Well, you know, even as a, as a kid, I remember reading Failsafe, serialized in the uh, Saturday Evening Post, a popular family uh, magazine this at the time, the late, 60s, late, 50s, right? late 50s, late 50s, late 50s, and it's, it scared the bejesus out of me. Yeah. And then seeing the movie Doctor Strange Love, you know, so I, I formed my opinions. And of course, in, in my generation, we did duck and cover drills. I mean, we lived with we the did. possibility yeah. that we could be immolated at any moment. In New Haven, where I grew up, every Saturday afternoon at noon, they they ran the air raid siren, and they did a test of the emergency broadcast system. So this was real, real stuff. But it didn't come back as a, um, as a profession until I joined the staff of the House Armed Services Committee in January 1985. And there I was assigned responsibility over a number of nuclear programs, what we call oversight responsibility, investigations, monitoring the budgets, particularly the President Reagan Strategic Defense Initiative, the missile defense program of Star the time. Wars. Yeah. So you were providing oversight on the Star Wars Well, you start investigating or? these, and at the time, we thought this was it. This was going to be the, the technological solution to nuclear war. That's what the president thought. Uh -huh. But even, you know, after a year of looking at this and hearing the testimony, it was clear that this thing didn't work, was, was never going to work, and it became increasingly clear to me that the only real solution to avoiding nuclear war was to reduce and eventually eliminate the weapons, uh, a position that President Reagan also endorsed and in the latter part of his administration he cut nuclear arsenals around the world by 50 percent working with uh, then uh, the leader of the Soviet Union Mikhail Gorbachev yeah. he became the greatest arms control president in US history yeah and I think that that was that was an extraordinary uh, conversion or yeah. uh, uh, epiphany or whatever you know a road to Damascus kind of experience that Ronald Reagan had and I, I I've often wondered uh, whether it was tied in with his uh, oncoming of Alzheimer's, or whether, <laughs> no. or whether it was a, a genuine... <laughs> it was. It goes way back, and you can read this in his biographies. As a young actor, mm -hmm. the, he was appalled by Hiroshima, yeah. and actually uh, wanted to engage in some protest against the nuclear weapons, but Warner Brothers Studio stopped him from doing that. That's and you go back, and he, he, um, he long felt that nuclear weapons, as he said uh, in public, were good for nothing and should be banned from the earth. And I now have the privilege of working with George Shultz, his uh, Secretary, Secretary of State. State at the time, who was with him while he was negotiating with Gorbachev, who feels the same way. He's one of the advisors on our Plowshares board. That's great. Didn't, didn't uh, Ronald Reagan say to Gorbachev, let's just eliminate these things altogether? They came real close at their summit in Reykjavik to having an agreement to eliminate all nuclear weapons, every single one of them, within 10 years. And you can see the transcripts, and these guys were intense. They were doing it themselves. It wasn't staff. Uh, George Shultz was with them in the room, and they came very close, and they stumbled at the, at the last minute over a hitch on whether to confine anti-missile defenses to the laboratory or not. The anti-missile the, the SDI Star Wars. program, yeah. So, yeah. Now, well, both uh, of them exaggerated their effectiveness. Ronald Reagan thought they would work, and Gorbachev feared they would. It turns out you could have let them go full bore, and they wouldn't have affected one thing or another. So we missed the chance to eliminate nuclear weapons by... Uh, uh, a couple of words because of SDI. That's that's remarkable. There were a lot of us back then who were suggesting fairly publicly that SDI was nothing more than a boondoggle that was being yeah. promoted by the weapons industry, uh, the defense industry. You know, they they were looking for a new source of cash, 
or a new source of revenue. And it was a trillion dollar project, as I recall, yeah. over the life of it. Oh, 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 right. So it start, like all weapons programs, they start off fairly modestly. A few million here, a few million there. Pretty soon you're, you're doing um, production of billion dollar programs that have trillion dollar lifetime costs. Right. So you're right. In fact, if I can segue, yeah, please do. that's the situation we face now. Same contractors now involved in building nuclear weapons, offensive systems, bombers, subs, and, uh, and missiles are about to launch us, the U.S., on a whole new generation of these nuclear weapons. They're working their way through the congressional budgets now. As the former chairman, uh, vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff says, James Cartwright, over the next two or three years, we're going to make 50-year decisions on whether we want to replicate the bombers, subs, and missiles we built during the Cold War. Do you want to do that again for another 50 years? If we do, it's going to cost us $1 trillion over the next 30 years. So we've got some serious nuclear budget issues coming up. Wow, a trillion dollars over 30 years. Yeah. And, then, and then contrast that with the fact that student loan debt in the United States is also $1 trillion. We could wipe out all the student loan debt, which would be the equivalent of putting a generation and a half, two generations of young people through college yeah. for free. We could do that going forward. We could put the right. next generation through college for free, or we could have a whole brand new generation of nuclear well, weapons. Well, and because the government doesn't compile the nuclear budget all in one place, these costs are kind of hidden from the public, from policymakers. Right. Members of Congress themselves don't understand how much these nuclear weapons cost. And it's not just their, what we could be spending domestically, it's what we could be spending on conventional military needs. So in the President's budget this year, we're cutting the Army, we're cutting the Navy, we're cutting the Air Force, we're cutting the Marines, the Guards, the benefits. We're increasing nuclear weapons costs. How does that happen? How did we come to that? Well, you know, we're in a position where the President of the United States, President Obama, came out swinging on nuclear policy. This was a, an issue he deeply believed in. He worked on it as a, as a senator. And he, he had a great first two years on this, but then he put it aside. He had these other issues. He kind of left it up to his staff, and I got to say, the program has stagnated. The policy has, has, has lost ground. And in this policy vacuum, in come the contracts. The contracts, they're doing what they're supposed to do. They're, they see their programs wearing out, their bombers, missile subs reaching the end of their operational life, so they propose new programs. So you have this policy program gap with the policy pushed aside and the contracts moving ahead. I'm not even sure President Obama understands the consequences of what's about, about to happen over the next two or three years if you let these contracts continue. They will be locked in and they'll build a constituency that's going to be very hard to overcome even for the President of the United States. Am I remembering correctly that when he was a senator he went to Dick Lugar, the uh, Republican from Indiana, I think? Indiana, that's exactly and, right. And who is uh, well-known, solid credentials Absolutely. As, as, a, as a military yeah, knowledgeable rock solid military. conservative. Yeah, and and said let's work together to, to uh, end nukes or to reduce yeah. the nuclear this is what I mean by Obama's personal commitment to the issue. When he came to the Senate, he sought out Richard Lugar, who was deeply involved in securing loose nukes, right. those, those weapons and materials left in the former uh, states the of the states. Soviet Union. And he said, Let, take me with you. And he tells stories to this day of the trips he's take, took with Dick Lugar to Ukraine and Belarus and Kazakhstan and what he saw and how that deepened his commitment. He then sought out Chuck Hagel another conservative Republican from Nebraska, and they authored together still what's one of the best non-proliferation pieces of legislation ever to be presented to the Senate. So he was working on these issues as a senator. I was honored to work on his campaign on the staff in 2007, 2008, and he, he put together what is probably the most comprehensive, integrated, realistic nuclear policy anyone has ever carried into the White House. He started implementing it, but now he's got a crisis on his hands. It's stagnating, it's slipping back. Will he rescue it in, in, time, uh, in time? Is there any kind of an organized movement to promote that? I mean, you know, we've got the, the anti-Keystone XL pipeline. You've got the, I mean, there's, there's all these fairly visible interest groups yeah. that are that are out there, and, and he's certainly aware of their, 
of their presence. Is there an organized anti-nuclear movement today? I, I remember the Brothers Berrigan. I remember, you know, I, I, I remember yeah, the, the yeah, days when yeah. the nuns were, you know, getting, well, actually, we had just had a nun well, arrested a few months ago. We huh? did. We did, and sentenced. Yes. Yeah, sentenced to three years in prison. Uh, well, actually, Plowshares Fund, the organization I, I had, and I tell the story in the last chapter of this book, was started in 1981 by a San Francisco philanthropist who thought that Ronald Reagan and Leonid Brezhnev were going to blow up the world in those early 80s. And that was the height of the anti-nuclear movement. A million people came out to Central Park protesting. Millions in Europe protesting the U.S. and Soviet deployments of, of missiles. And the, the public outrage worked. It really affected. We know it affected Reagan. We know it influenced his decisions and led to the, the treaties that now cut us, cut us back. You're never going to see that again. That's Why not? Because there isn't that sense of urgent threat. You know, the Soviet Union collapsed. The Cold War is over. We don't do well, double Russia cover still drills. has thousands of nukes, ah. and we still have thousands of nukes, and now we've got this conflict in Ukraine. And that's is, exactly right. Is that so something the Cold that could War be a nexus point? For but the weapons remain. So you have people like us, we're still at it. You know, uh, 32 years later, we're still working on it. Plowshares Fund. Plowshares Fund, and there's a network of groups that range from the Carnegie Endowment to the Arms Control Association to little grassroots groups like, like Peace Action who are involved in these issues, still plugging away, still pushing, still feeding ideas into the administration. And in critical issues like Iran, Mm -hmm. coming to the fore and engaging in a political battle in the U.S. Congress, although whether we can make a deal with Iran or whether we're going to go to war with Iran. Yeah. What's your sense of that? I the, think we're going to get a deal. I think the U.S. and Iran, for the first time in the history of the Islamic Republic, are both willing to talk at the same time. The great tragedy of the relationship has been when one side's been willing to talk, the other side is not. But we have a new president in the United States who's willing to talk, the past president wasn't. And we have a new president in Iran who's willing to talk. They're engaged in serious, ongoing discussions. Just this week, the senior administration officials gave a briefing on the talks and said, we are in continuous contact with each other. Our experts are working at it. The diplomats meet again Monday and Tuesday uh, in, in Geneva to continue the discussions. I think the underlying strategic imperative on both sides is driving towards a deal but there are opponents in both countries, hardliners in Tehran and in Washington, who don't want a deal. That's the political battle. It is. More of tonight's Conversations with Great Minds with Joe Serenciani after the break. And welcome back to Conversations with Great Minds. I'm speaking with Joe Serenciani, president of the Plowshares Fund and author of the new book, Nuclear Nightmare, Secure in the World Before It's Too Late. Uh, you're an advisor to the State Department, and and I'm yeah. curious, uh, you know, from the inside and also from the outside. You're also on the outside. Uh, your thoughts on uh, today? There was not bad in the New York Times by John McCain saying yeah. that uh, this this conflict with uh, in Ukraine with Russia uh, is because the president is weak and he's making the yes. country weak. And it, it seems to me that they're trying to Jimmy Carterize um, President Obama for for both the president and for posterity. And I don't even think that was a fair hit on Carter. I think that was the, the result of the Reagan PR machine. Yeah. Um, so I'm curious your thoughts on that and, and also your thoughts on how the State Department and the, and the administration in general are reacting to these things. Sure, I'm happy to do that. I'm proud to serve on the International Security Advisory Board to Secretary Kerry. Um, but he's always happy to hear me say that I don't represent the views of the State Department and these views are, pu are purely my own. You know, I, I think Secretary Kerry is turning out to be a remarkable secretary. I think even su uh, surprising many of us, surpassing our expectations, really tackling the hard uh, problems. I was on CNN's Crossfire a couple of weeks ago with Newt Gingrich and Bill Kristol, and they were attacking Kerry as weak and ineffective and terrible, and all these, you know, ad hominem attacks, adjectival attacks. And they do the same with Obama. They try to present this frame. McCain is part of this. So that whatever Obama does, they put in the frame that he's weak, he's dangerous, naive, doesn't care about American security, might not even be an American. Right. And they just reinforce that over and over again. I don't think this affects the president. I don't think it affects the, or the vice president or his secretaries. But I think it does have an effect on the staff. 
I do see the staff kind of pulling back, afraid to, uh, to do something that might be characterized as weak, afraid to go ahead and push treaties. They don't want to make a mistake. They don't, they don't want to take a risk. Peacemaking is perceived as weakness as right. opposed to war making. So you see them always emphasizing, uh, for example, how much they're spending on nuclear weapons or, how, or defending the Department of Defense budget. They don't want to be seen as, some, as proposing uh, uh, independent cuts in nuclear weapons, while U.S. and Russian negotiations on further cuts are, are frozen for the moment, the, the staff is, is intimidated and doesn't want to let the U.S. come down on nuclear weapons, even though we now have more nuclear weapons than Russia does, and, and the Joint Chiefs agree we could safely come down. You see the staff holding back on this. Right. I had an interesting conversation with John Dean about this a year or so ago about the the psychology of the neoconservatives, mm. um, and I don't I, I don't want to characterize or quote him, I, you know, but but it, it got me thinking. Um, I think well. broadly what he was suggesting was that there's there's some kind of deep seated fear in some of these folks that probably has nothing to do with. Um, the, the, the world around them. It probably has to do with the world that they were six years old in and or the family that they were six years old in. But they can never have enough weapons. They can never have enough yes, muscle. Right. They can never have enough domination. Wow. And it, it, and this, this is the worldview that McCain and Lindsey Graham and, yes. and, and uh, Joe, uh, what's his name? Lieberman. Lieberman and, and you know, the, 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 the guys who are and kind of... Bill Crystal. Yeah, who are and, proud to and, call and, themselves neoconservatives. All, all, all that, yes. Reflect, and I'm curious, you know, I, feel free to say you're not going to psychoanalyze somebody, but I'm curious what your thoughts are <laughs> about that, that kind of branch of American yes. politics and what well, it's doing to our policies. Well, you can see, I believe these people are stuck in the middle of the 20th century, that their views might have been formed uh, during the Cold War, but they are they harken back to the Holocaust for some of them, mm -hmm. to World War II, to Munich. Look how often they make the Munich comparison. Do you know how many negotiations we've had since 1938, 39? Yeah. But that's the one they're fixated it's on. All about Neville Chamberlain. You know, Ford would have go to have a field day analyzing these guys. What is going on there that they keep going back, trying to correct the mistakes of their great grandfathers? Okay, mm -hmm. so that's where we are now. So you can see that's their answer to everything. In chapter two of the book, I don't want to plug the book too much, but Please. in chapter two, I go over what their policy was during the Bush years when the neoconservatives took over the national security apparatus mm -hmm. and led us into this disastrous and unnecessary war with Iraq that has cost us trillions of dollars, the lives of tens of thousands of our best warrior, and squandered U.S. credibility and legitimacy. A big part of the problem Obama has is that we're still trying to dig out of the hole these guys dug for us. And on their, their nonproliferation policy, wasn't treaties. They didn't want to do treaties. They don't want to do neg negotiations. The Munich analogy again. They want more weapons. Their policy was, you don't, as Dick Cheney said, you don't negotiate with evil, you defeat it. So the war in Iraq was supposed to be just the beginning. We were supposed to roll through Damascus over to Tehran. And you see that, the echoes of this, more than the echoes, the implementation of this theory still in how they're treating Iran and the struggle over whether we can negotiate with Iran or, or do we have to go to war with Iran? And the negotiations are framed as Munich, as appeasement, as giving in. And the only answer is a war with Iran. I'm telling you, a war with Iran would make Iraq and Afghanistan look like a warm-up act. Yeah, I, uh, absolutely. I, I can't, I, I've just been shocked by how many times just in the past couple of weeks I've heard um, neocons on radio and TV. Yeah draw a parallel between John Kerry and Neville Chamberlain. Exactly. I mean, it's, it's just over and it's over again. And you know, there's something about this. You, it's the big lie technique. You just keep saying it over and over again. And however untrue, some of it sticks. So you can see some of the American public buying into this. So are you suggesting um, that the Bush doctrine was a mistake? And, and if so, to what extent has it been repudiated? Have we turned mm. away from it? And to what extent are we still hanging on to pieces of it? Well, you, you can, you know, this is Washington. We argue about policy all the time, but the great thing about policy is it leaves a track record. So right. you can go back and look. And almost every non-proliferation problem the Bush administration inherited, and they were considerable, they made worse by their policies. So when they ended, you know, there were no centrifuges spinning in Iran when they took office. 
North Korea did not have a nuclear bomb when they took office. There are 20,000 centrifuges in Iran now. North Korea has done three nuclear tests. India and Pakistan's nuclear arm race has taken off. They each have 100 nuclear weapons each. The credibility of the United States in our, in our efforts to try and con stop nuclear terrorism, stop new states, reduce nuclear arsenals, has been weakened by their efforts. You can see what happened, and yet, politically, they're still they're still championing these causes. This is one of the main reasons Obama hasn't been as successful as he wants to be, has been the ideological and political opposition to every step he's tried to take. Yeah, and I, 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 you know, I've seen that in domestic policy as yeah, well. Yeah, same mean, thing. This goes back to that, uh, that meeting in the caucus room restaurant the night that he was inaugurated where the Republicans uh, from the House and Senate got together and said, we will do everything we can to oppose With him, no matter Newt what. Newt Gingrich there, yeah, yes. Newt was there in front of In fact, Newt came on my program, and I said, wasn't this treason? And he said, no, we're the opposition. That's what we're supposed to do. And well, I'm you know, I'm, I've been around long enough. I remember during the Reagan years and working with the House Dems to try to cut some of these unnecessary programs like the MX missile and the B-2 bomber. But when Reagan went to Reykjavik to negotiate, they all gathered in the rotunda, in the, and, and Tip O'Neill, got on the phone with his Senate co colleagues, and they dropped the amendments to cut those weapons because they didn't want to undercut the president as he was about to negotiate with the Soviet leader. I mean, politics really did stop at the water's edge. The president called from Air Force One as he was flying to Reykjavik to thank the congressional leaders. Can you imagine that happening now? I can't, and that's the tragedy. Um, you mentioned, uh, in, in, sort of in passing, but I think it's a big deal, uh, India and Pakistan. Actually, before oh, yeah. I get to that, yeah. uh, there, there's in a couple of weeks, there's this meeting, the Nuclear Security Summit. I, oh, yeah. I don't want to miss this. This is coming up uh, next week in The Hague in the Netherlands. What's, what is that, and what's, what's the significance of it? Well, on, on Wednesday, I'm flying out to participate in some of the preliminary activities, the non-government organizations. You asked about the organized lobbying groups. Yeah. We're going to be there in full force and for two days be debating policy on this. And then on Monday the 24th, the President of the United States is leading this nuclear security summit. Leaders of 50 countries from around the world will gather to synchronize their efforts on nuclear terrorism. Mm -hmm. How do you stop a nuclear terrorist from blowing up New York City or Washington, D.C.? You stop them from getting the materials, the highly enriched uranium and plutonium. Those are in stockpiles around the country. You need all the countries cooperating to secure and eliminate those materials. That's what the Nuclear Security Summit, uh, that's what they do. It's one of the greatest successes of the Obama strategy, a brand new uh, pillar of our security. They'll make some progress, but it's, they're going to fall short. The president had hoped to secure all these materials within four years of his taking office. We're five years in. We're still a long way to go. He needs to take bolder action and work with those countries that are willing to take bolder action, or else, I'm afraid, sooner or later, terrorists are going to get their hands on this material, and we're going to see a nuclear bomb detonated in a major city around the world. This, this is very concerning, and um, in the two minutes or so we have left, you mentioned uh, Pakistan. They so one hundred nukes. I mean, this is a country Osama bin Laden was hanging out in. It's a country that we're killing people with drones regularly, and I mean, there's the very anti-American sentiment developing in the West. But Iran does not have nuclear weapons, and may never have. Pakistan has a hundred and an unstable economy, an unstable government, strong Islamic fundamentalist influences in their military and intelligence apparatus, and as you just mentioned, Al-Qaeda is operating within the territory of Pakistan. And they share a border with India, also nuclear armed, where they fa they've had four conflicts in the last 60 years. So this is a serious nuclear danger. I call it the most dangerous country on earth. You've got to work to prevent any conflict between India and Pakistan. You've got to work to, re to reduce the terrorist threat inside Pakistan and get Pakistan to stop making nuclear weapons. They're making more nuclear weapons than any country on Earth, and they're making them smaller and more portable to be used in battlefield conditions. That increases the security threats. So for my money, it's not North Korea or Iran we've got to worry about where the next nuclear threat comes from. It's Pakistan. In, in 30 seconds, what do we do about that? 
Well, one, you've got to help them improve their economy to give a future to the otherwise desperate people that are, that are fueling the terrorist threat. Two, you have to work much harder on resolving the India-Pakistan differences, including over, over Kashmir. And, and three, you've got to get out of Afghanistan, because a lot of what's destabilizing Pakistan right is what we've point. been doing in Afghanistan. Joe Serenciani, thanks so much. Thank you, Tom. My keep, pleasure. Keep up the great work. Thank you.